Well, thank you so much for joining us at this Road to GEC event as we prepare for the Global Entrepreneurship Congress that's coming to Melbourne from the 19th to the 22nd of September of this year. Um, as we head into that, we're going to be having these sessions around the different focus areas for the GEC um, where we unpack and we say, well, what are, the, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And if we're going to get 4,000 people together in a room to all talk about things on how we can fundamentally transform our world, let's do a bit of pre-work so we're ready for that conversation. So that's what this conversation is. We've got a, an amazing uh, uh, group of leaders around the panel here today, uh, as well as heaps of people popping in to, the, um, to observe as the attendees. We do want to make this interactive. Um, uh, so as we're going through this, we're having a bit of a, a fireside chat, a bit of a yarn with, with some amazing people here talking about regional entrepreneurship and challenges and opportunities. But we have um, amazing leaders as well in the attendees list. Please use the chat, use the Q&A, uh, we will make this interactive um, and uh, bring in your comments as we go through. Uh, and I also have time for Q&A at the end uh, as we have time left over. So we will be going for about an hour today. Um, as we get kicked off, I do want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we are all on uh, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging who are absolutely part of this conversation. And we will um, be engaging with them uh, as, they, as we talk about what the impact is for regions. Um, and I do want to actually bring that up uh, as we continue on to some of the challenge opportunities on voices that are in the room and voices that may not be in the room. Um, so definitely having those conversations. So as we get kicked off by ways of introduction, my name is uh, Chad Renando. I'm a managing director for the Global Entrepreneurship Network here in Australia. I'm also a research fellow with the University of Southern Queensland at the Rural Economy Center of Excellence and CEO of Startup Status. And we're mapping and measuring the innovation ecosystem here in Australia. Um, and I'm here with some amazing panelists. Uh, I just feel so honored to be on the on the same Zoom screen with these guys. Um, what I'd love to do is hand it over to each of you in turn. And as we do, I'd love for you to share with us all three things. First, who you are and what you do. Second, um, just a, a high level thought on um, what you see as, as challenges and opportunities for regional entrepreneur ecosystems. And third, if you were to describe regional entrepreneur opportunities, what we affectionately call entrepreneur ecosystems in regional communities and rural communities as a vehicle, what would that vehicle be? If it's kind of floating around, not really landing, is it a bit of a, a parachute or a hot air balloon? Is it a rocket ship where we think it's just getting ready to take off? Is it a is it a youth that's been sitting there for a while, might need a, a new transmission or a new engine put into it? Or is it the latest car coming off the lot? A pair of tennis shoes or a hang glider? If you were to describe regional entrepreneur ecosystems as a vehicle of any kind, what would that be? And for those in the audience watching, feel free to put your thoughts in the, in the chat as well um, or in the Q&A. Um, yeah, in the chat. And uh, we can we can have a bit of a conversation around it. So I might start, Julia, with yourself. Okay, thanks, Chad, uh, and welcome everybody. And I'm also very happy to be here. Uh, so my name is Julia Spicer. I live in Gundawindi in southern Queensland, right on the border of Queensland and New South Wales. And it's got a population of about six thousand people in the town, and about twelve thousand across the shire, the council shire of, of which I live in. Uh, I am the, I'm very happy to be the chair of Gen Australia uh, and inherited or um, took on that role after attending the Global Entrepreneurship Congress in Saudi Arabia in 2022 uh, and with Chad and, and other Australian delegates. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that experience uh, as we go through today, but certainly happy to play the role of chair and, and looking at what this means across our Australian ecosystem. Um, I, I am a, a child of Western Queensland. I have always lived, uh, worked and grown up in small communities across Western Queensland. Um, and, and I guess uh, with a background in environmental science, but always looking at how we as people uh, are looking at solving problems. And so what I didn't realise was that was also the definition of innovation and entrepreneurship until more recently. Uh, so, so I think uh, 
one of the challenges that we have sometimes is a language barrier. Uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to be, I think there's so many opportunities for the regions. I, I genuinely think that the regions have the answers to the world's problems. Um, we just need the opportunity to be able to solve them. Uh, and, and I think that because we are, we are innate problem solvers. We, we do that on a regular basis in whatever format that might be, ag tech, education, health, environmental, looking into climate and decarbonisation now, but I think we are inherently problem solvers uh, because we've had to. That's that's just how we've all grown up and how we interact. So for me, uh, my vehicle that I have chosen is a Datsun Ute, which is a vehicle that I learned to drive in. It was old, it was sturdy, it was reliable, it was unassuming, but whatever job you needed it to do, it could do. We could modify it to be whatever it needed to be um, and it would always get the job done and, and we could rely on it in any circumstance. So that's going to be the, the vehicle that I think uh, is what happens. And I think that's part of our opportunity as regions is to look at how we can step out of this unassuming, just get the job done and really kind of hold the space for us to genuinely acknowledge the contribution that we are making to solving the world's problems. So I'm really keen to have the conversation today. Yeah, thanks for that, Jules. Yeah, I love that. It dots and Newton can kind of always can get the job done, but um, you know, how can we adapt it, as you say, and, and take it to that next level? I love it. Um, Joe, over to you. Thanks, Chad, and thanks so much for having me. Um, my name's Joe Palmer. Um, I'm the founder and managing director of Pointer Remote, and we are a platform that organizations can advertise um, remote jobs um, if it doesn't matter where the person filling the position lives from anywhere in Australia. Um, we've got a really strong focus on, I guess, activating the talent that lives outside of rural, I mean, outside of metropolitan areas in Australia. And um, the business idea very much came about after I realised how many of my very clever girlfriends had left corporate careers to marry farmers and had found themselves, I guess, isolated from the workforce or isolated from the career or um, industry that they were highly skilled and experienced in. Um, I grew up in a small town like Jules, a town of about 2,000 people in southern New South Wales and um, until recently lived on a farm near an even smaller town um, called The Rock, which is in southern New South Wales, which has got a population of about 300 people. But I am dialing in today from the thriving metropolis of Singapore, where I am now located with my husband, but um, again, and two children. Um, but the joys of remote work, I've been able to obviously continue doing all the things that we do from here. Um, I also spend a lot of time working with organisations in, I guess, a, a transformation piece and the helping them to sort of put the systems and processes into place um, to really be able to leverage remote work and leverage technology. And majority of these businesses are in rural Australia and um, the tyranny of distance is always an issue with um, attracting and retaining talent, but also there is a huge opportunity to be able to leverage remote work if they've got the right systems and processes in place. So I'm doing a lot of those things. And then as a way of being based in Southeast Asia now, um, I've got another whole arm of my operations are actually supporting rural businesses who are looking to export into Southeast Asia and using Singapore as a, um, a stepping stone. So I'm coming into today's conversation with some really interesting, um, I guess, opinions and ideas and like opportunities. So I look... I could spend hours like all of us could here moaning about what I think the biggest challenge for entrepreneurship in rural um, Australia, which is around connection and connectivity. And I'm sure everyone is almost sick of hearing about it. Um, but as Chad mentioned, we're really keen to sort of talk about opportunities that you can sort of um, actually manage. And I think that there are some really interesting organisations and companies, surprise, surprise, that have started in rural areas, like a shout out to a company called Zetify, as far as being able to, to get like Wi-Fi access across really big areas. Um, there's another organisation um, called We Sky, no, something along those lines. But again, some really interesting opportunities coming out of 
innovators um, in rural areas that are helping with that connection piece. But again, um, I'm seeing opportunities for rural Australia with a really different lens at the moment now being based here in, in Asia. And we just have, this is just an untapped opportunity over here for rural businesses who are willing to think outside the box and to be able to do some navel gazing when it sometimes takes leaving Australia to realise how little we are, but how um, much, I guess, pooling power we have on a uh, on an international stage and our clean green reputation and our ability to do business to really create strong business relationships and reliability around that I see a huge opportunity um, in Southeast Asia for rural rural business and rural entrepreneurship um, my vehicle I guess is a bit more aspirational and I think that this is a, networking and access to networks is both a, a challenge and an opportunity for for rural business and so my I'm I'm torn between like a Tarago or a minibus as my um my thing or a stretch limo with a bar and potentially lights and a smoke machine but the idea being around that you can jam a whole lot of people from all over rural Australia into a a little, um, a little vehicle and the connections and opportunities that come out of people in a confined space with the additional maybe drink or two and a um, karaoke mic, um, I think really amazing things can happen. So that would be my, my vehicle of choice. Awesome. Thanks for that, Joe. Um, yeah, absolutely love uh, like so many insights in that and kind of building on what um, Jules was saying as far as always being able to modify it. I absolutely love the thing in your story as far as you're solving a problem and each time in your different entrepreneurial journey, you're solving a problem that you have. You know, hey, this is a problem for me to solve it and the you know, like Zetify and all these other ones. And so we do talk about these big things, even Wi-Fi connectivity. Next thing you know, there's somebody out there with, you know, a bunch of towers and stuff strapped together and they're providing their own Wi-Fi and, and connectivity. So I absolutely love it. And I love the vehicle and um, probably lean more towards the limo because it sounds more like a bit of a party. Love it. Thank you. Um, and uh, Kat, thank you so much. I didn't realize that the chat was available. That's a lesson for future uh, events. We won't, won't be able to, I think, enable that now. But if you want to just, you know, feel free to, to spam the Q&A with your vehicles. If you're in there in the audience, we'll, we'll treat all those as separate questions and be able to answer them accordingly. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll get that going on. Thank you for that. Deanna, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chad. Oh, it's wonderful to be here this morning. Uh, this is a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, I'm uh, currently in the role as the Director of Research at the Regional Australia Institute. And in that role, I manage a portfolio of public interest research um, across all sorts of regional um, development questions. So things like transitions to net zero and getting the most out of your local labor force are on my radar this year. Um, but I have just completed um, you know, three years of research looking at entrepreneurial ecosystems in Northwest Tasmania. And um, I'll, I'll come to the, some of the, the things out of that in a moment. In terms of my background, I grew up in a, in a small uh, town in regional Queensland, Mara. It was a mining town. It is a mining town. I grew up uh, on a farm there. And then I spent uh, 20 odd years in Brisbane and now I live and I'm coming to you today from beautiful Palawa country, which is in the northern Midlands region in the middle of Tasmania. And I live in a little town with about 3000 people just outside Launceston. So it's been nice to come back to a rural place. And while I was in Brisbane, I was working internationally um, in, in high tech industries. And I still uh, this year am convening the Australasian Simulation Congress. Um, so I keep my finger in the tech pie, but when you come back to a rural place sometimes and have a look at the kinds of entrepreneurship people are working on and, and the problems they're trying to solve, sometimes it can be quite difficult to reconcile um, these bigger conversations that are happening in cities. And I really struggled with that in the research that I did over the last three years. And I think one of the things, this is my, the challenge that I, I can see for rural entrepreneurship um, is the way we measure it. Data is a really big problem I think in this space um, you know that comes down to a lot of definitions how we think about things like knowledge and talent and what we're using as metrics um, for measuring those and what those things do is create a self-reinforcing narrative um, about the deficits that are in uh, rural areas so 
um, and you see that reflected in the kinds of comments people are raising about what they would like to see um, in this conversation and um, and it's certainly part of the international academic debate about whether or not entrepreneurship um, and entrepreneurial ecosystems as they function in high performing economic regions can actually be a vehicle for improving um, well-being in smaller places. Um, in terms of my vehicle, I'm going to um, cheat a bit and probably put two parts to my vehicle metaphor, Chad. I really struggled with this. Uh, I'm going to use, use a boat as a metaphor and specifically I'm referring to the trim tabs on a boat, which help to sort of stabilise a boat and, and think about the lift. And when I think about a boat, I think about some regions have more like an aluminium dinghy with, some, with an outboard on the back and they're getting a little bit of lift on their boat. Um, because I think entrepreneurship really is, is a vehicle for lifting uh, economies. Some places, as if you've been in any you know, rural region that's warm, that's got a river, you'll see all sorts of ski boats and other faster boats. And I think some areas do have those kind of boats. But I also think that um, entrepreneurial ecosystems sort of act like a fleet. And it's that collectiveness and, and the uh, dynamic between those um, firms and the, the actors who are around them supporting them moving together um, in, a, in a fleet sense. So that's me. That's my thoughts. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that the academic rigor behind it. Um, and yeah, that that metaphor as far as the collective, like we, we heard from Jules as far as the adaptability of it and, and Joe as far as being able to um, kind of take everybody with us um, and, and also that that whole transition on, on um, kind of solving the problems that you're experiencing yourself. And I love as far as the, the diversity, yes, it is that lift, like you mentioned, but we do have to do that collectively together as well. Uh, and also bringing in that, that international perspective. Um, and segueing into the international perspective, which Deanna, I'm sure you meant to do. Uh, Tina, absolute pleasure to have you off here all the way from the US, um, thanks to the, to the wonders of what connectivity we do have. Um, I'd love to hear more about you and what you do and, and what you reckon your vehicle is. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Chad. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here with this great panel. Uh, rural is my passion, so I'm excited to talk about that. Excited for GEC. Uh, hopefully, I will get to attend as well. So um, my name is Tina Metzer, and I am co-founder of National Center for Resource Development, also co-founder of Rural Rise and Rural Rise Tech. And my story started like many people, you know, I, I have a degree that I don't really use and I and I, then I became an entrepreneur. And that led me into helping entrepreneurs and into the nonprofit world. And then I try to work with my passions, just kind of like Julia said, you know, it's the environmental and rural. That is really, truly a passion of mine because I do live in a very rural community. I don't really have a town. It's kind of a town, but not that large of a town. So very, very small. And I see the challenges every day. Uh, part of what we do with Rural Rise, and one of the things we found at Rural Rise was kind of what we're doing here. There are amazing things happening all over the world in remote and rural areas. Absolutely. You can look at this nonprofit and you can say, wow, how are they doing that? How are they doing that in that area? And that's happening everywhere. And we always use the kind of the, the quote that if you see one rural community or visit one rural community, you've been to one rural community because we're all so different. Mm -hmm. However, that's, what we can do is we can learn from each other. And that's so essential because I may be able to, I am based in the States. I may be able to get something program that you all are doing in Australia. And then I'm like, why did I think of that? That's brilliant. I should have thought of that. That is a new way of thinking. I just didn't quite ever think about doing things that way. So I think it's so essential to make these connections. And GEC, I think, is a very important connector as well. It, it's great to get us all together. Um, and that's one of the things we did. Like I said, we found at Rural Rise quite a few years, like four or five years ago, like why, is, why aren't we talking? Let's all get in a room and talk. Let's all have a monthly call. Let's share those resources. Let's share that programming and try to work together. Because if I have something great, I want to share it. I don't want everyone else to have to struggle to go through that same path because we've all made mistakes. If you've worked in a nonprofit and rural, 
I have bet you went down the wrong path and you've had to kind of change and pivot because that's just the way it happens because it's based on industry, terrain, whatever it may be. Um, and that kind of leads me into the challenges. And, and I think everyone kind of touched on my challenges. Deanna, with the, with the measurement, so essential, you know. Um, how do you measure the impact of entrepreneurship? You know, we're always traditionally looking for these high numbers that we can't compare to large urban areas. We just can't do it. So how can we creatively measure that? And so many things are working, so many different organizations are working on that because we should be considered a very important part of economic development. We are in economic, you know, it's quality of place and it leads into economic development. The other thing is, Joe, you mentioned connectivity, essential. Like it is essential for entrepreneurship, for education, you know, the last few years have pro proven that. And I have worked with so many different communities where it's not an option, like it is not there. Uh, even where I'm at, the cell phone, the cellular coverage is very, very low. And it makes a difference. It makes a tremendous difference when you're trying. You're not on a level playing field with everyone else. You're starting at a disadvantage. Um, and then my last challenge, and I do like to stay positive. The last challenge is, is that capacity issue. Uh, you know, everyone, well, not everyone, I'm sure there's some people in rural communities that have a lot of a lot of people working, a lot of that, but most of the people in rural communities, it's that capacity. It's like we're working really, really hard. We don't have enough assistance. A lot of nonprofits are depending on grant funding. A lot of businesses are working really hard with just one person. It's that capacity. Uh, and I'm sure we'll probably touch on Chad, that workforce, you know, the challenges of when you have a small business and the workforce issues. Um, and it's also, you know, just that time and people capacity. And if leaders leave, it makes a big difference. Um, the opportunities. I think we're we're so innovative in rural communities. Come on, we've like we we can go in and we've we've changed if an industry leaves, we have to like change things around. It's survival. It's it's going into the mountains or an area and like making a town. Like it it it's very there's lots of opportunities in rural communities. There's outdoor recreation. And I think more people are seeing like these great things that can be had in rural communities. And and unfortunately, the pandemic kind of focused some of the things on outdoor and some of the things like, oh, I would like to live in a rural community. Uh, I would like to like to do that. And there's some opportunities there. Um, so I think there's great uh, opportunities in rural communities. My vehicle there. I work with so many different things. I think it's kind of like it's a little bit of every vehicle because it depends where you're at. You may be like you may be on a horse, you may be walking, but you may be on a truck and you're pivoting around mountains or you may be in the most you know high tech electric vehicle because it all it's going to take it all to make it work and, and bring rural entrepreneurship forward and ecosystem building forward. So it's all of the vehicles. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm very, very excited to be here. Yeah, I love that, Tina. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I love the, the diversity of the vehicles. I just saw, you know, a person walking up to a EV truck with a with a horse trailer. I don't know, with some, something carrying it all together. Uh, maybe, maybe pulling along the limo as well. Um, no, that's that's really good. And, and that capacity one you raise is, is really interesting, like particularly in regional communities where, you know, we do have an excellent, you know, strong leadership. And and but the thing is that people are involved in so many different things. We often refer to what they call that, that keystone species, where you always find the, the two or three things. When I go into a region and we, we do ecosystem mapping, we often ask, you know, if you were gonna do something new and use maybe technology in a different way and maybe get customers in a different way, noting that we don't use the word entrepreneur, startup, innovation, any of that. We just say, look, if you're gonna do something new, who do you talk to, where do you go? And when you go to a region and ask that, they often point to that you know, same two, three, five people. And those people are involved in everything. So capacity is real. And then how do you often get paid for that thing, you know, and create a sustainable model around that that's um, helping support this new way of thinking that's not business as usual. Um, four things I want to pick up on, you know, how do we unlock that adapt, um, the ability to adapt the, and, and encourage that? Um, and Jules, that, that point you made where people do it, they just do it the way they normally do it. But how do we then leverage that to, have real opportunities. Um, you know, we often talk to as you and I banter around those numbers of the, the regional tax, the extra cost for an entrepreneur doing something because of the low internet or because of lack of connectivity or, or lack of access to service providers or lack of access to talent. How do we solve the practical problems we're experiencing? Um, you know, and Joe, 
every single point. Like you're a, you're a testament and a um, kind of a, an inspiration on every time you've experienced some of these challenges from workforce or whatever, you create a business out of it and do a thing. Well, and apart from saying we just need more Joes in the world, how do we make it easier for the rest of the Joes that may not be quite at the level of a Joe yet? Um, how do we do those collective ways of working together? Um, you know, we, we know that in order to uh, effectively compete with uh, some of the opportunities that you may take for granted in a, in a central area, we need more of a collective approach. We need to um, work together, not just across regional lines, but potentially national lines. Um, and also then how do we learn from those global examples and, and build capacity? And then within that, we have the specific challenges, many of which were raised around workforce. Some of the things we haven't mentioned is around funding. You know, there's a few people that raised in the introduction um, registration of funding, but there's no real solutions for that raised as yet, as far as that risk capital. Um, promotion and advocacy for the work that is doing. A lot of really great things, but how do we share about it? I love the point, Tina, around measurement. You know, and how do we embed measurement when that's extra cost and it's a, it's a complex thing. And the final point I'll make is around some of the things that may not typically may mention from youth to women to First Nations, uh, you know, as we look around the rooms, you know, making sure that everybody's represented. Um, so I throw all of that as a context. It's been a great context setting piece to, for the rest of our chat. And for those in the audience, please feel free to put questions in and, and you know, even share some of your vehicles in the chat and any comments on some of the stuff that's been said. But I'd love to open it up now and just say, what are the opportunities? We've identified challenges, identified a common shared understanding. Practically, what could we do, say in two or three years to make the world a different place? Some of you, Joe, you're already doing some of the stuff and Jules, you're seeing heaps of the chief entrepreneur. Deanna, with your with your research you've been doing, and obviously Tina with that with that national perspective with rural rise and the rest across the U.S. How do we how do we do a step change in two years so we don't just sit back and watch it evolve as, as a natural evolution? What can we do? Pat, I wouldn't mind picking up on a couple of points you made and. Um, I was involved in a project sort of at the end of all of last year, actually, which was a women's entrepreneurship project uh, here in Tassie, although it does have national reach. Um, and it focused on um, really, I guess, a curious women. So getting people, women at the nascent stage, um, but it wasn't exclusive to that. So if people, um, people could come with just an idea or they could come with a business that they'd already started. And it was a very, very early stage sort of boot camp incubator program to then um, move people into a, a, a more complex accelerator down the track. Um, and I think what really amazed me was two things out of that, out of that program. One was... Um, just the, the basic confidence that people needed to be given that they had a set of skills that was probably relevant and then to show them how to, how to steer those skills. And we were really astounded. I mean, about 100 women went through this program in Tassie and how many of them had said that they'd been told their entire life that they couldn't and that this wasn't somewhere they could go. And, and to just actually hear their stories and then pick up on the things that they were doing and then steer them in the right direction um to make you know to get them thinking about what was their exit strategy and and did their could they make a profit or were they just going to basically dig a great hole for themselves with this idea did it actually have a market and how could they put some structure around the business all that entrepreneurship capital stuff that's that's really important in fostering entrepreneurship and another piece of that program that became quite interesting was looking at how we use this concept of, of uh, lighthouses which has come out of some research in um scandinavia i think but um, a person who's already started a business, who's doing, you know, who's doing reasonably well, who you can point to and say, hey, here's somebody else in your local area. And, and in this particular project, one of the lighthouses was a lady who um, was in her, she's probably in her 50s or 60s, um, had a long farming background, had decided that she wanted to start making, um, this was the, the context was fast moving consumer goods. Uh, she was making a product that she was putting into supermarkets and she'd been told her whole life that she couldn't. And the number of other people who were inspired by hearing her story um, 
to, to push through and, and how she'd had support through this incubation program. Um, and then the project, the pro the, the project, I, I will say that the name of the incubator in the project, because it's interesting to watch how it's unfolding, is it's called Seed Lab. Um, it started off with some federal funding and some support from the Tasmanian government. More recently, um, it has now been um, supported for the last few years by Woolworths. And it, it runs um, a program to help people into the Woolworths supply chain. But it's not just limited to that. It's also running some other programs to help people just do markets or agritourism or, or other things. But yeah, lighthouses and, um, and confidence for women and, and, help, and saying to people, it's okay, um, it doesn't matter what kind of business you're trying to start, you've got to start somewhere. Let's have that conversation rather than cutting it off saying, well, you're not trying to start a high scaling, high technology business. Therefore, you're not an entrepreneur and you can't be part of this conversation. I think that was really quite interesting. Thanks for that, Deanna. Um, yeah, it's a good point. The lighthouse and also representation in the lighthouse, um, just so that when I'm looking at it, it, it looks like something that that I'd be able to aspire to. Mm. Um, and Jules, I want to pick up on, on the point you made in the chat, though. We can see the lighthouse, we can have the confidence, but man, I am at capacity. We hear that a lot. Like, like you know, it, it's a matter of finding out how that lighthouse did it and how they navigated the capacity or are there other things that we can do, you know, from funding to, like, what does that look like? Yeah, I, um, one of the things I, I forgot to mention in my introduction is I have um, taken on the role of Queensland Chief Entrepreneur. So it's an advocacy and championing role uh, within Queensland government to uh, really shine a light across the ecosystem. Um, and, and, I'm the fifth, I'm the first regionally based and I'm the first um, ecosystem builder, let's call it. The previous were quite technical, were very, um, you know, had a very uh, technical specific background um, and, and I've kind of waltzed in as this, you know, um, cheerleader of all. Um, and, and so the conversations that I hear people having um, are around, you know, the, the exporting, the opportunities for growth, the whatever, you know, Bob in Emerald, you've got this great widget and you could be exporting this all over the world. And Bob goes, yeah, I would love to be able to do that, but I need to get off the tools and so I need three more mechanics so I can do the thing to export, to make the, to whatever. And I've got nobody that can take that role on. So, so I think, you know, we still have some of the foundational challenges um, to be able to actually unlock the potential. And so for me, I think it's around, um, you know, I think there's a there's 100% a role that government plays, uh, both at the state and federal level. And Tina, it would be the same in the states and all over the world. At the same time, I am also a believer of, I want the government, I want to be able to tell the government, here's what our community thinks, this is what we want, help us. Or get out of our road <laughs> nicely um but but we're going to do this and here's how we can do it and so i think some of the conversations then is around how do we unlock the opportunities that we actually have in our own communities so some of that is around we actually have wealth in the regions we need to look at how we can unlock that differently so we could do joint ventures amongst ourselves we could set up some trusts and deliver some things we could do you know, some sort of syndicate investment group to be able to support the lighthouses and the Joes in our communities. Uh, that That's not that difficult. We just need a solicitor in town and an accountant that can help us do that. We have those resources and we actually are used to investing. We're just not necessarily used to investing in individuals or in startups. We're used to investing in more traditional conservative sort of real estate or shares or whatever it might be. So part of it, I think, is how do we get some clarity around what we actually want our communities to look like? And we are the only people that are going to be able to answer that. Uh, what are the opportunities? And then who do we want to work with to do that? Because the reality is it comes along when there's already enough good news stories really you know they're not going to be there at the beginning because we might not we're a risk at the beginning but they'll bounce in when there's a few good stories and there's some women that you know we can have a photo saying 10 women have started a micro business as a result of the work that somebody's done 
So sometimes I think we ask government for support too early before we've actually genuinely looked at what we want our own community to look like. And then the other thing for me is I also kindly, I don't, I don't, it's not that I don't care, it's that I can't attach to what a bigger centre has done because that's not what I've got going on here. So I've got more chance of understanding from Tina what she's doing in communities that are in that six to eight to 10,000 population than I do a Toowoomba or a Brisbane or a Newcastle or a Sydney. So, so I actually think the opportunity and what I took from the Saudi Arabia GEC was the fact that I got to talk to the Tinas and the Julias and the Joes of every other small community across the world rather than other communities in Queensland or Australia, to be fair. And I think that's, for me, the exciting next step of where we can take this. And then government will always support good work, but they, they're they not the first step. And I think that's sometimes where we have assumed they would step into that role. And I don't think that's their role. And I don't th I think we're wasting time and energy thinking that's where they should help. Yep. And I think to add to that, <laughs> is um, I know a lot of times there's kind of like if you're in a small town, it's the trust issue too of like, uh, you know, I don't want a government to come in and tell me exactly what I need. I need, you know, let listen to what I need, listen to what we're doing here. Uh, and I think that makes a big difference. I, and I totally agree with you, like kind of working together and listening to each other. And I found like, we could talk about this for days and days. I think Joe had said, we can talk about this for days and we still wouldn't be finished. We still wouldn't have everything we needed to know. Um, but I feel like it's, if we want to start at like kind of the basics in a region, I have found that kind of getting the people together and what I call like action groups or or just kind of setting around the same table because we have that, that shareholder a good example of this is outdoor recreation or like an agritourism. You know, there may be the best business in the world, but you really, no one's going to travel two hours to your business. But what you do need is you need the community around you. You need all of that, not only the support, you need to know what everyone else is doing. You need that sense of community. You need that sustainability. What's it going to look like in the long run? That regional approach, that ecosystem building leads up to sustainability. It leads up to then you can go and you'll have a better chance and with the government support and with other larger support areas. So I think that a lot of times entrepreneurs, and also the languages, I use entrepreneurs, I don't call everyone, you know, a lot of people that's that language barrier. It's not just us in different countries, or you're all trying to understand my accent, but it's like, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not, I didn't, I'm not techie. I don't know what you're doing. I'm a farmer. I, I invented this like water thing, you know? <laughs> So it, I think that language is extremely important as well. I think the language can be highly isolating and um, polarizing. I think that that's something that I sort of found when I started Point of Remote. It was the third company that I'd started and I was a small business owner prior to that. And Point was very much a small business and it wasn't until someone's like yeah but it's a tech platform so you're a startup and you're you're an entrepreneur and then all of these words sort of got thrown at me and I was like Ugh. and it's it's problematic and it's uncomfortable and I I I think that especially looking at an Australian scale of things we're not big enough to be isolating huge parts of the business community around like semantics like I think that that's a real challenge that we face but I wanted to sort of go back to what you were saying Chad as far as like looking at the things that we sort of have put as challenges so access to capital um, that ability for promotion being able to measure data um, getting representation from across geographic areas but also um, minority groups and all of those things, and also access to the capacity. I, you're asking for solutions and what can we do with that? I genuinely think that networks are a, a really all-encompassing solution to these things. So like you touched on, Jules, is that access to capital, again, in startup world, that gets thrown around, especially in startup world when you're female, 
and you're a mother and you're rurally based, like I tick a lot of boxes as far as like um, the foot stamping, as far as no one funds startups like mine. But again, I think we've been doing the wrong thing, which is chasing venture capital and looking to metro areas and government and stuff to sort of support this stuff. Like you said, there's a huge amount of money in rural Australia, like us getting organised, using a network, like the the access to capital of people just with around just a little bit of education and what that looks like, getting funding into businesses that look and feel like what someone else in your town is interacting with as a customer or um, like seeing on a regular basis I just don't think people would even think to do that. I think a perfect example is, say, um, say a big farming operation. None of the kids want to come home, so the parents sell the farm in their 60s. All of a sudden, they've got 15 million bucks in their bank account that, not meaning to pigeonhole a lot of, um, like, the boomer generation, but they could put that in, like, a low-risk managed fund or whatever after they bought their $2 million house on the coast and then there's only so much golf you can play in a week. But if you sort of planted the seed with, like, you know what, join this angel investing group. You know what you can do? You can be the seed funding and you might put... 50 grand into a female rural led startup in western queensland and that person will make that money work for you and you'll see return and they might say come on my advisory board and you know you're then sitting on board meetings in between playing golf and retirement's looking a lot more interesting than it might have been previously so i think that really getting organised and pulling together a network that is not ostracising around terminology. I think we then, as far as what you were saying, Deanna, organise people, you've got data, you want data, just get them in the one spot and then you just like survey the bejesus out of them. Like that's how you how you get to sort of solve those things. Capacity, if you're introducing other people that are alleviating others' capacity issues, Again, you're starting to tick off those challenges and you're not having to look externally for it. And so I think, I mean, I think the other piece for me, sorry, I'm jumping in, but the other piece for me is also just around what's the business model that's solving the problem in a community. So the the more remote we are, the less services there are available, the more likely there is a not-for-profit or a social enterprise or some other structured business doing the role for the public good. And I think we need to be really conscious that um, we don't end up with wastelands across our uh, low populated parts of the world because individuals or groups have taken done the heavy lifting of of the public goods. So this is this is not just about you know um, profitable businesses. This is the social enterprise and the not for profit space for me as well. We've got innovative models across Australia and they definitely be across America too where they're really doing a role that somebody else should be doing but isn't. And so I think we need to be really conscious of how we also support that. So, you know, how do we make sure that people can uh, retire to their own community and have somewhere to live? How we actually, you know, I don't want my 90-year-old grandmother to have to leave the community that she's lived in her whole life because she has nowhere to live, you know. So I think we, there's there's a whole fabric of community that rural, regional and remote people end up being responsible for and therefore those business models look different. In Australia, there's more people employed through social enterprise than there is in mining. You would not think that based on the conversations that happen or if you watched the news on a regular basis. So there's this, the business model piece and how we actually are looking after people, planet, place, I think is also really important in this conversation, Chad. Yeah, thanks for that, Jules. And really great insights. I want to unpack those. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, one of the other things I want to inject in there, uh, and Joe, just briefly on that comment, totally agree. And for those who may not be familiar with the Australian ecosystem, we did see an explosion. There was this big ideas boom in 2015 and, and a lead up to that of this whole startups and innovation entrepreneurship that had a big impact. We saw 
you know, a, a big uptake of, of innovation hubs and co-working spaces and accelerator programs and, and funds. Um, it, it did ostracize, absolutely. I, I question though, and I think we might be rationalizing again, we might be coming back together. Just this conversation, the fact that we're having this now, people that have been through that say that wasn't right. And so by the time you say that, I think things have already started sh to shift, probably needs to do some more. But that language piece is, is very important. Uh, the other thing I wanna throw in there is on things that people quite often don't think about innovation or entrepreneurship initiatives or policy in that can, you know, it, picking up on some of the comments that were made around, it's not that I don't have the idea. It's not that I, of course, I, I know about the R&D grant. I can see this thing I've got. It's amazing. And I got to fix my stuff because I got an active business. I need five people. Unless I get those five people, I don't have time to actually work on my business and scale. I don't have that luxury. So there's certain realities around workforce, which ties into housing, which ties into livability. And there's heaps of things that are this supplementary around the thing where we can go in there and, and train them on pitch practice. And they'd be like, mate, yeah, but I got to house people. And, and what about where's my family going to live if I move there to be a tech person to support these regions? So I just want to throw that in there as well, as far as absolutely the network, but then how do we do that within the some of the, the constraints and potentially even addressing some of those constraints um, that is what it takes to be a regional entrepreneur. Keen to hear your thoughts on that. Can I throw in my two Bob worth about as far as um, skills and I get really frustrated around the dummy spitting that there's no one to do these jobs. There's no one to do these jobs. I know I'm in the remote workspace and I know that that is not a catch-all for a business in Western New South Wales that needs a fitter and turner. Like I get that. That is a, a tools, hands-on, like hands-on role that needs to be filled physically there. But what I see with, you know, lowest unemployment rates ever, I still have got the highest number of people registering as job seekers on pointer remote that we've had in years not because they're not employed, but because they're wanting to work in a different way that employers are not getting with the program on that. So that really frustrates me because like a lot of the work that I do with my consulting hat on is with those sorts of organisations that know they've either got a product or something that they want to scale, but they know they've got to get their house in order and they know that that means systems and processes and what do we actually need people physically doing here? If you're in theory, wasting resources that are physically already where you are, that have a house, that have a family, that the kids are already at school and are playing netball and football in the town, they don't need to be doing any of the jobs that could be shifted to someone that's not physically located there. So really auditing what your workforce looks like and then leveraging a workforce that is highly, highly mobile in a remote sense to actually do a whole lot of the tasks. And I think that mindset shift around, I need five FTE in order for me to do this, I that causes me great frustration because it's just easier to hire just someone else before I actually have a think about how I'm setting things up. So that I feel is a mindset shift that really needs to happen with business owners whether they fit into whatever we want to call them, startups through to highly, like really long, long established businesses. But um, again, that's a huge opportunity for, for things. And I just wanted to quickly touch on as far as like what can make it work really well on that macro level is like my pinup town that I always use in, in as an example is a town called Tamora, which is in the Riverina in, in New South Wales. And what they have just done the most amazing job was around is that they, the, the local government, they've got an amazing economic development officer who has got a really strong relationship with their business chamber, which is really um, a fabulous relationship. They have co-organised and established a co-working space. They built a 70-spot childcare centre in town because, again, there is all these women in all of these towns, and I know that's a massive generalisation, but we all know the primary caregiving lands on their lap. 
and they've got the skills and experience to do not only remote work but physical on the tools work but there's no one to look after the kids and so again being able to do something in a town like that where they've built a really amazing thing and then created jobs for a lot of young people in the community um, there's also that opportunity to leverage that network um, of small business owners and startups in really isolated areas what does that look like with literally sharing the kids around that you you work five of you work four days a week because you've got kids all together like that's literally what I grew up doing my there was no childcare in the town that I grew up in and my mum worked four days a week with five of her friends and they all had nine kids one day a week on the day that they weren't working at home and we all got chicken pox at the same time and we did all of those things but it's that real using the network to actually think outside the box for it as well. Yeah, I love those examples, Joe. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I'm keen to hear from other people as far as um, uh, Tina Jules and Deanna, as far as uh, like examples of thinking outside of the box like that, as well as um, kind of practically from both a town perspective and entrepreneur's perspective, what, what can be done. And Kat, thanks for some of your comments in the chat as well, some of the, some of the, the connectivity networks that you've come across as well. Take it away, Tina. Okay, great. Um, I think that um, there are so many different innovative programs happening in, in entrepreneurship. And um, we can't forget, like, it's the quality of place. And that quality of place is the child care. It's the health care. It is all of those things because we all, and, um, I know in, in the US, some rural areas are losing some of their child, their not only their childcare, but their healthcare, their hospitals and things like that. So it's that quality of place and it's all of this kind of interconnectivity of making some place that we want to stay, our children want to stay, um, that we can continue to live in, uh, whether it's remote work or entrepreneurship, but it's that it's that sustainability and building this place. Um, and many times as we kind of plan out everything, we need to think about, we need like foundational entrepreneurs. We need that innovative entrepreneurs. We need all of those people in your region to make entrepreneurship successful and to make that, uh, that place something that we want to come back to. It's, it's teaching entrepreneurship. It's changing the mindset of that. We have to be very creative. We have to be very innovative starting at kindergarten and on about how we can stay and be creative and, and have this sense of place and be proud of where we live and, and be able to make a living to be, you know, in economic development. So I'll take it really quick because it's 7.52 right now. So Deanna and Julia. <laughs> I, I think, thank you, um, Tina. And if it's okay, Chad, I'll jump in on um, regionalization ambition because really this is what the ambition is about. So, um, Regional Australia Institute uh, earlier this year launched our regionalisation ambition, which is a framework for taking this holistic approach to livability. And what it's underpinned by is 10 years of or so of our research looking at the issues across regional Australia and, you know, really understanding, you know, using population as one of the drivers, what's been happening with Australia's, you know, population, regional population. And one of the things we found is that there was a view for quite a long time that um, regions' populations were declining overall and everybody was moving to the cities. Now, there are declines in, in some regional areas. There's no doubt about that. But there's a net gain to regional areas that wasn't understood. Everybody thought that just happened because of COVID, but it actually predates COVID. And there's been for a long time a regional gain in population to, um, or, yeah, to population. It just isn't growing at the same rate that it's growing in cities. But what's happened because of this view of the decline is we've had underinvestment in regional Australia in all of these areas that you've just talked about, Tina, you know, health, education, um, you know, other capacity building that's necessary in the region. And so what Regional Australia Institute's really focused on at the moment is turning attention to that and saying, well, you know, if we reinvest in improving that and redistributing some more population back into regional Australia, we have some modelling that shows net gains to the national economy by growth in, in uh, regional populations. 
And so it's really about saying, well, what parts of those eroded? It was almost like COVID sort of emptied the dam and then we saw all the broken infrastructure underneath. Um, and, and it's been so clear to us that you have to take a systems approach to it. You know, and one of the things I was noticing in Chad's introductions to this whole session, and, and everyone's spoken about it this morning in the conversation, that entrepreneurship is such a multifaceted beast. And it's and it's multi-directional too. You know, it's it it needs things from the place in which it operates and it gives things back, those sort of similar things back to the place in which it operates, employment, you know, wealth, investment, you know, um, as well as all of the social benefits that come from certain networks and social relationships um, and, and overall improving people's well-being. So it's ridiculous to think that we can address entrepreneurship in regions without addressing all of that holistic other stuff as well. Um, so what we're doing with the ambition is asking people um, to make pledges across Australia. It's got to be something we do as a whole. We can't just sit back and say, well, the government must fix this um, because it's not going to work that way. But actually looking at different groups and different organisations saying, have a look at the ambition. If there's something in there that you think you can do that contributes to fixing one or more of these things, whether it's attracting people to live in your region, whether it's pointing out what your local innovation looks like, whether it's um, committing to starting a new um, uh, initiative to get more nurses in your local uh, health centre. But let's try and build it collectively. I raised the data issue because, um, yes, we can do surveys, Joe, and I think that stuff's really important. I think my concern about the data is that lots and lots of analysis about what needs to happen in regions is drawn out of census data. And census data is really not great at telling a story about regional Australia. Um, and there are limited other data sets that actually can contribute into that. There are a few. Um, you know, I'll pick on Blade as a great example, which is one data set out of the ABS. You can't look at it at subnational scale. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, no, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problematic thing as well, even the terminology, because I think realistically Australia is broken up into four geographic areas, which is metro, regional, rural and remote, and they all do need different things. And I don't know, I find it challenging sort of, you know, that that net positive migration to regional Australia when you call Geelong and Newcastle regional. I, I still, I find that still really hard and the challenges that are faced in tech, well, cities like that, that are so different to that of Gundawindi or The Rock. Like I think that that's a real yeah. challenge as well. And we do work across, I probably haven't explained it as well as I could have in, in that conversation, but we do work at the LGA and even town scale. Um, generally because that diversity is huge and even if you take we we use a different model which looks at you know, similar to those remote and, and less remote we have a, a different set of measures that RAI came up with some years ago I'm not quite sure of the heritage of it which is heartland regions connected lifestyle regions um, industry and service hubs and regional cities but it's essentially that's a similar approach of breaking everything down. But even within those groups, as you say, the diversity at the town scale or the LGA scale is, is significant. So um, we're, yes, we're absolutely on, on having to be aware to that. And, and that's, again, where I say the, for me, my complaint about the data is that it's virtually impossible to deal with that level of diversity using national level data sets. And we need to be having much better conversations about um, how we measure regional Australia in all of its um, vehicles to come back to Tina's all the vehicles question earlier. Yeah. And Chad, I guess I'll jump in just in our last couple of minutes and say, you know, we've we've focused today's conversation a lot on regional Australia and and um, but but I think we can extrapolate that. So uh, for Tina and and others on the call today who are in other parts of the world, um, everybody joked about in Saudi Arabia there were. 3,000 people at this conference and within about a day and a half, I am 100% sure I'd met every rural person that was there <laughs> because we all just managed to congregate somewhere and sort of looked at each other and went, I think you're my person. You are, you're my person. So I had yep. Uganda sorted. I had Equatorial Guinea. There was no rural person I had not met in about the first 36 hours of that week-long event. And I think that's you know, in terms of the shared stories, the shared opportunities, the shared ideas, 
that learning is brilliant. And so what I've seen in the chat and from the conversations here, Chad, I'm sure you'll do it, but, you know, I've been following the work that Tina's been doing since we were part of her conversations a while ago. And Tina, I can assure you, I'm always forwarding it to somebody else. Deanna, it's great that RAI is doing the work, you know, so I think even today we've been able to share enough examples and hopefully people are on the on the call can do that because I think the solutions are there. It is just about finding that capacity and finding the ability to really leverage on it. And I think, you know, certainly that's what I'm hoping at a Queensland level we can do through the Chief Entrepreneur's Office. And Chad, I know that's the work that you and I want to do with Gen Australia. Yeah, thanks for that, Jules. And thanks, everybody. It's a huge shout out. I'm so appreciative of your time and for the people that were uh, uh, participants as well. Um, I put a couple of links in the chat. Uh, absolutely, the rebalance the nation, yeah, that's, that's great. We're actually using the rebalance the nation framework to see the challenges for the GEC. When you attend the GEC with 4,000 other people, um, that we will be focusing on challenges. It'll be a bit different than many other conferences in that you'll actually be able to work with other people, find your tribe and say, let's actually put our hand at the till over the next 12 months after the event and, and try and make headway on this from networks to connections to connectivity. Um, uh, we're really gonna be focusing on that. I also threw a map in there, which is um, I put the flags in there for support for regional uh, entrepreneurs in the Australian innovation ecosystem as a support. I'll be emailing all the stuff out to the participants and we'll be writing this up as well. Again, huge shout out. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing everybody in person on the 19th to the 22nd in Melbourne. Uh, hope to see you all there. Uh, please register early so that you can stay up to date. And um, apart from that, thanks so much. It's been amazing. Love the insights. Great work, Chad. Thanks, ladies. Thank you. See y'all.